Welcome back, Night Owls. This is Dr. Nighttime, and tonight we're solving for E. Well, approximately. I'm obviously not going to be able to get E, the number with infinitely many decimal points, to infinitely many decimal points uh, by hand. Right? But we can get a reasonable approximation. Uh, so, first of all, uh, we'd say, I, I compare this to asking how big is pi. Right? We know pi is a similar number, like 3.14, whatever. And if we want to know, well, how big pi is, we can just take the definition, right? ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter, and then just, just grab a can of kidney beans and a tape measure, and you can get your estimate that way. But if we start with the definition of E, it's not quite so clear how we can do that. Right? We get this limit as x goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over x to the x, Right. or this thing with the factorials in it. And either way, as you extend your number of terms, either taking a larger value of x or adding more of these reciprocal factorials, you know you're going to get an underestimate, so you can always say, well, I know e is more than some amount, but there's no clear way, at least not at first glance, of getting an upper bound for it. So. There's a difference between saying, well, I know E is a little bit more than this, and being able to say for certain it's between this number and that number, and having those bounds get closer together. Uh, I will mention there is a way using Taylor series to work with these factorials to get a more precise estimate more quickly than the one I'm going to work with. Uh, for this video, I won't be talking about Taylor series at all. I might do that in a later video. But this will work entirely with this limit definition of Euler's e. Limit as x goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over x to the x. So, using the uh, conventional compound interest problem, with the compound interest definition, every compounding frequency, no matter how rapid, will always give a slight underestimate, because you're assuming that the interest is compounded on the starting value, the value that was at the start of that tiny little compounding period. What if the interest were based off the final amount? Well then, since it's based on the highest amount you would have, then it would get you an overestimate. So now that we have an underestimate and an overestimate, in theory, we could just increase the compounding frequencies and get a very, very slight overestimate and a very, very slight underestimate and just say, well, it's got to be somewhere between these two. And that will give us a range. Maybe we'll use the midpoint of that range, just for our best guess. But either way, that will get us tight bounds on how big or small E could be. But of course, calculating the interest, if we calculate based on the initial amount, right, that's straightforward to do. Just multiply your initial amount by the interest rate times the amount of time and that tells you the amount of interest. If we try to do that with a final amount, uh, we get an implicitly defined equation. So we have to calculate this slightly overly generous interest. We say i equals 1 plus i, right? the interest equals the final amount. Notice the final, if we assume 1 in principle, one, uh, $1 of principle, then the final amount will be $1 plus the interest. We say, if our time width is that 1 over x, we'd say i equals 1 plus i times 1 over x. Or 1 plus i times 1 over x, right? Uh, this gives us the simple equation i equals 1 over x plus i over x. Move the i over x to the other side, so we want to isolate for i. i minus i over x equals 1 over x. That gives us i times 1 minus 1 over x equals 1 over x. And multiplying numerator and denominator by x here, we get i times x minus 1 over x equals 1 over x. With some algebra, we get i equals 1 over x minus 1. So that tells us that for our upper bound, we can assume that the interest rate, instead of being 1 over x, is going to be 1 over x minus 1. So for our underestimate, we have 1 plus 1 over x to the power x. For our overestimate, we have 1 plus 1 over x minus 1 to the power of x because we presume this slightly greater interest rate of 1 over x minus 1 was compounded x times. 
And so if I plug in a value for x, let's say x is 1,000, we'll get that e is greater than 1 plus 1 over 1,000 to the 1,000, but less than 1 plus 1 over 999 to the 1,000. If I plug in x equals 1,001, then I get 1 plus 1 over 1,000 to the 1,001. And notice that would still be an overestimate. Or I could say I just take the substitution, let's say k equals x minus 1, I get 1 plus 1 over k to the k plus 1. Either way, I get that for any whole number x, for any positive number x, 1 plus 1 over x to the x is less than e, but 1 plus 1 over x to the x plus 1 is more than e. And that gives me a rather narrow window. Well, assuming x is a large number, I can make that window as narrow as I want. Uh, this is uh, called the squeeze principle. That if in my limit, the left bound and right bound are approaching each other, then I know my actual quantity has to equal that shared value. And so I, I can get over and under estimates for just values of x. I can plug in, I think here I plug in x equals 1,000 and x equals a million. And for my lower bound, I get 2.71692. For my upper bound, I get 2.71964. For x equals a million, I get 2.718280 or 2.718283. So we know it's really tight bound for e. This, of course, I did not calculate this out by hand. I used a calculator for it, but notice that would be a standard arithmetic calculator where uh, not one that you could just say, hey, tell me what E is. So that at least gets us a way of showing how big E is to within whatever narrow band we need. If we if a 1% error is acceptable, we can say x equals 100. If a 1 part per million error is acceptable, we can say x equals a million. All right, as always, if you found this interesting, like the way I explain things, and want to arrange private lessons, click the link in the description. And until next time, this is Dr. Nighttime wishing you a good night.